Oh, ho, ho, buddies. Hey, it's Concert Buddy here. Thanks for joining me again for another presentation of Vinyl Community Podcast, specifically my series, Mind of the Record Collector. I'm joined for this conversation by Rocco over at the YouTube channel, Pieces of Vinyl. Rocco started his channel a little bit after when I started mine. We're about in the same ballpark, about a year and a half. But I'm telling you, it's amateur hour if you watch Rocco's content compared to mine. And what I mean by that is production value is off the charts. I found his channel through the, the grace or the influence of the YouTube algorithm. It suggested a video of his one time. And so I checked it out and I was blown away. Come to find out that there's a reason his production value is so high. And that's because it kind of ties into his day job. And we'll kind of get into that in the conversation. But not only is the production value super high, but the actual value that I learned from his videos is right up there as well. It talks about a lot of stuff that you don't see often discussed on YouTube and specifically vinyl community on the forum boards, wherever. It talks about soul music, talks about vinyl me please, talks about different genres and artists that are outside of my wheelhouse, but have cost me a few dollars and Rocco and I <laughs> talk about that. <laughs> As he's brought new artists and new styles of music to my attention, I've been very handsomely rewarded by taking those deep dives with him. So anyway, we get into all those things, finish up with the lightning round. I mean, if this is your first time joining us, thank you. If not, you know what to expect. But enough jibber-jabber. Let's get into the conversation right now. Yeah, we've got that one too. First pressing, even. You're listening to Vinyl Community Podcast. Buddies, we are back in the building. Got another terrific episode here on Vinyl Community Podcasts. This is a series calling Mind of the Record Collector, where I'm talking to a lot of different record collectors from a lot of different backgrounds and getting their unique takes on the hobby and their experience in the hobby as a whole. I'm joined for this episode by Rocco over at Pieces of Vinyl. Rocco, how are you? I'm great, man. Thank you very much for having me on. My pleasure, sir. So for the folks who may or may not have seen Rocco's channel, Pieces of Vinyl, on YouTube, I, I, I credit or blame, depending on your point of view, the YouTube algorithm, because we started our channels roughly about the same time, and it was one of those things where YouTube just kind of suggested a channel or showed me one of your videos, and then we were off of the races. When, when, when did you start your channel approximately, Rocco? Pretty sure I started my channel right at the end of March, uh, like around the beginning of April is when I first uploaded my first video on this channel. So, so you're about a year into, a little over a year now, right? Yeah. Yeah, and it's been an amazing year. I mean, I can't believe like how much growth has happened on the channel in one year. Um and then, you know, it's it's been a lot of fun. It's been a lot of fun meeting people like yourself and meeting other people. I was on Rachel's Ghosts over the weekend, and I've met a bunch of other people and had another other great vinyl recommendations as well, as you're saying, the algorithm tossing up good channels. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, what was the, or maybe as multiple things, but what, what was the call to action that stirred you to say, you know, I'm going to start making YouTube videos, let alone YouTube videos about record collecting and vinyl records? Yeah, I mean, pretty much anybody I know that that has been around me for the past 10 or 15 years has heard me talk about YouTube. I'm pretty much obsessed with it. I do video work for my main job, and I started doing that probably about in like 2009 or 10, and I'm completely self-taught from YouTube. And so I've always wanted to like do a channel or have something in that vein. I just didn't know really whatever to talk about. And so just recently in the past couple of years, we moved into a new house and it's been great to spread out with my vinyl collection again and also have room for video equipment as well and be able to even like do something like this. So um, I really wanted to start talking about vinyl because it's one of my biggest passions, like besides, you know, making videos and stuff like that, that stuff's cool, but I feel like that's like the that's like the background of this. You know what I mean? Like it's like, I want to actually focus on something, you know, like I even envy people that talk about like Apple products because like, that's a specific thing that's other than a camera, you know, that they can talk about, you know, right. cause talking about the camera itself is cool, but you know, I really, you know, and even stereo equipment too. Like 
I found a lot of channels right when I first started about like, you know, right when you first started to get into this, you'll see like either like audiophile channels or like vinyl collecting channels. So especially, and they're kind of all the same, you know, some mm -hmm. people are talking about vinyl records on channels where they're mostly talking about stereo equipment. Um, but with stereo equipment, I feel like it's like, I'm going to buy like one stereo. I'm not going to buy 50 different stereos. You know what I mean? Like to be able right. to talk about all the different stereos for a channel. So having a thousand you know, records, you can keep talking about records forever. And plus, you know, you could talk about the artists or you could talk about the actual pressings or, you know, the history behind the record or anything about it, you know, even, even just the music itself. So it's, it's a lot of fun. And I, I think it's, you know, been a perfect mix for me at this moment with like video and vinyl records. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about your production value and we can get that in a little bit because you my opinion, I've told you this directly your production value in the community is like top tier. And obviously you just said it, right? Like you, that's kind of your, your, your bread and butter, what you do in your, in your quote unquote normal life. So it's really cool how that kind of melts together those two worlds. And it, it provides top tier presentation, not only in your subject matter, but in your, you know, obviously presentation, the cutaways, lighting. I mean, it's top tier. So tell me about, uh, Thanks. thank you. <laughs> compliment verbal, verbal bouquets for everybody. Um, <laughs> So, you know, probably, and correct me if I'm wrong, like a lot of us, like, you know, we think about starting a channel for a while, could be years, could be months, whatever. Were there channels, particularly in the vinyl realm that you were watching that you're like, man, this is a really good channel. I'm learning a lot from it. Or they're specialized in a certain thing, like channels that, for lack of a better word, like were inspirational and a push as you've you know started kind of doing the stuff in the last year. Well, I mean, like mostly most of the channels that inspired me to actually like get into making a YouTube channel were not really vinyl related. They were mostly camera related. I mean, I've been following like camera creators, you know, for for the past like 10 years, you know, um, I mean, I could name some of them if you want, but those guys don't need any press. I mean, they have like millions of subscribers <laughs> no, and they're, and they're like the most popular ones out there. Like, you know, like Peter McKinnon and like stuff like that. I mean, if you've ever heard of that guy, um, it's funny because I kind of have a love hate relationship with him. So I shouldn't even be like pushing him, but um, it, I, I first, some of the first vinyl channels that I found that really got me into it one of the first ones was not actually a vinyl direct channel. It was actually an audio file channel was the guy cheap audio man. I don't know if you've seen Randy, his name's Randy, the cheap audio man. If you ever have, if, if this is a good plug for his channel, if you ever have any questions about anything hi-fi related and he is amazing because he specifically considers himself a, a hi-fi enthusiast as opposed okay. to an audio file, like, or, or anything like that. Like he's like, he's so not, snobbish about it his name is the cheap audio man you know so it's all about like you can get really good sound for not a huge price and um so he was one of the first ones that i found because it was more functional for me about like i got back into collecting records again i had kids right <laughs> that put a complete that put a complete kibosh on collecting records for like 10 years right okay and it's funny because um, we'll get into Vinyl Me Please in a little bit, but like, I had never even heard of them. And I, it just so happens that this is their 10th year anniversary. And it just dawned on me that my son's about to turn 10. And I was oh, like, oh, right. That's why, because I've been paying attention <laughs> to him for the past 10 years. That's why I, I had no idea. So like, so, so, um, needing cheap audio equipment has always been a priority. And then, I've not been expanding my record collection. And then I started getting into it for the past couple of years and, you know, slowly but surely finding YouTube to do that to, you know, well, what turntable should I get? What cartridge should I get? You find the cheap audio man. And then through him, you find, I think one of the first other channels that I found was um, the InGroove was Mike from the InGroove. In fact, that was one of the first ones. Yeah. Yeah. He had a video that was, um, he bought George Benson's record collection, right? I don't know if you've seen yeah. that video of his, yeah, yeah. but it, oh man, what a great video and what a great record collection. And like, 
I am a huge fan of George Benson. Like oh, he's okay. one of my favorite jazz guitarists. He's one of like CTI records. I have like all of his CTI records. He's, he's an interesting jazz guitarist because like a lot of people know him from like Breezen and like all the stuff that he does. Basically, I stopped with George Benson in like 1978, anything post 1978 with George Benson. I'm like very skittish on okay. basically once he starts singing and I shouldn't say that. I mean, he's a great artist and he's a great guy, but like, you know, the, the guitar playing that he did back in CTI with like Steve Gadd and like Jack DeJanet and stuff like that is just so good. And um, so when I saw that video of his buying Re George Benson's record collection, I was like, this is amazing. And I'm like, and then I'm like, Oh, this guy's got a record store. Another early one that I found. Um, have you ever heard of NTX vinyl? Yeah. Uh, G. Sanders, uh -huh. yep. mm -hmm. Yeah. GI Sanders. Yeah. And um, so he was another one that I found right away. Um, and then I was like, well, these guys all have record stores. And then Noble Records was another one, yeah, um, sure. Dylan from Noble Records. And again, I'm like, these guys all have record stores. I'm like, so I guess that's what is going on now. Like if you have a record store, then you have a vinyl channel. But then you start finding people like Michael 45, um, you know, a 45 uh, RPM audiophile. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was another guy, um, uh Danny from Sonic Flare. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but uh, Sonic Flare is like I can't. He's a he's seem. I'm pretty sure he's good friends with Michael. He, he's in Europe, I think, at the moment. But he's like another like very high end guy. Like him and Michael have these like fifty thousand dollar systems. You know what I mean? And like these like crazy audiophile systems and these crazy audiophile collections. Um, and so like that was also like okay, well can I do this? Like, do you need a record store? Do you need a $50,000? You know, like, your lane setup? And how like, it fit. yeah, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's where I've been just trying to be like, okay, well, I, uh, another guy that I will talk about that I, that I still watch to this day is a guy named Matt Diavala. He's, um, he's a YouTuber that is actually just a filmmaker. Um, he has, a couple of documentaries on Netflix about minimalism. Oh, he, he oh, that's the minim oh, minimal. I love the minimalist. Oh, that's the director. Okay, cool. Real cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. He's, oh yeah. Yeah. The minimalist. Yeah. Yeah. He made that whole documentary and like, he was the director of it and he's like, his whole channel is real amazing. And he's got like, he's got a whole like, um, you know, course through his channel to like learn about his production and like learn about all this stuff. And so I really recommend it to anybody who's interested in starting this one thing he talks about is on YouTube, you kind of need like this triangle of success. And he credits somebody else of talking about this, that you have, you can either have really good production value or really good entertainment value or really good information. So like you could literally be talking on an iPhone or, you know, a laptop or whatever. But if your information is like the most valuable information and everyone wants your information, then you'll have plenty of success on YouTube. If you, you know, really lean in onto the entertainment side of things like Mr. Beast, and you're going to entertain people with these amazing videos of cool shit, you know, like then you're going to have success on YouTube. The mm -hmm. other side of it is the production value the production value, I think, still needs one of the other two tiers to really survive. Like, I don't think that one can, like, survive on its own. So that's where I was like, okay, well, I could at least provide that. I could at least provide production value, and I could at least, you know, um, succinctly say things. And I do know what I'm talking about when it comes to certain vinyl things, so my content can kind of hold up there and then... If I can make people laugh once in a while, then maybe I'll get some entertainment in there. But the whole idea is to try to get all three spheres of that triangle. And if you can, that's when you'll get millions and millions of subscribers, you know? Um, but uh, so, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Because, you know, like somebody I'll be telling you a story just like you were there and you hear a name. You're like, oh, yeah, that sounds familiar. As soon as you said that Matt guy's name, I'm like, I've heard it. But it, because it's, it's it's not like Matt Smith, you know, it's not a very common name. Right. So as soon as you, and I, I apologize if I cut you off, because as soon as you said minimalist, I'm like, oh, that's the minimalist no, no. director. That's amazing. Yeah, I, 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 I do the whole minimalist thing. You wouldn't know it looking at my record collection. It's one of the two areas where I'm terrible at minimalism, record collecting and my sneaker collection. And that's because I used to work for Nike. Right. But. Oh, I didn't know oh. that you used to work for Nike. 
Oh yeah, 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 yeah. But anyway, long-winded way of saying I love the minimalists and and I do the Patreon thing with those guys. Anyway, that's that's me going off on a fanboy that minute for a second. Um, but let's 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 kind of no, hone in on, let's kind of hone in on the production value stuff because um, a lot of people kind of what we we're just talking about. A lot of people, Mazzy, I know I've seen it firsthand. Films his videos with his phone. You know, so there's a there's not a lot of you know pomp and circumstance to it, but obviously melding your professional experience into this experience kind of sets you above. Is it when you're planning your content, how much work goes into, or is it just second nature at this point where you're like, you're set up everything, you know, because, because you have a lot of good cutaway shots, you do a lot of different kind of, you know, like now you do like the little uh, pop culture clips and the little TV. So, so there's definitely a lot of work involved, but for you, it's probably not as, uh, arduous as it would be for like Joe Schmo like me. So how much planning goes into these videos that you're making? Well, yeah. So planning is really the, the, probably the most important thing and the most, like, that's probably the best way to be able to handle this and be able to like churn out something and then continue to churn out something on a monthly or weekly or daily basis, whatever it might be. Um, and so like, so to start out with, I, cause like, I want, this is a great forum to, to bring this up in, like to be able to talk with somebody else about this, um, about the whole production side of this in the vinyl community. Cause you're right. A lot of the creators in the vinyl community really don't have a lot of production value. And I don't know if it's out of choice or know how, or just, you know, whatever, you know, whatever it might be. Some people choose not to because they don't want it to get in the way. You know what I mean? Like, right. like, and you know, the content is really the most important thing. I think I was just talking on Rachel's ghost over the weekend with, with Mazzy about that. And Mazzy was saying like, he likes to just do it on his iPhone because for him, it's just like spontaneous. He's just going to sit down, pull out one of his records, talk for 25 minutes about it. And then, you know, maybe, maybe edit one or two things here or there and then move on. Okay. Um, but like, I, so, so I'm a weird person. <laughs> I definitely, um, I definitely think way too much about everything I do. So like, like in everything I do, I, th I overthink everything. And then I also get really, really obsessive about it. So like, I've gotten really, really obsessive about vinyl and I've gotten really, really obsessive about video creation to the point where like, like video creation is very secondhand to me, like using final. So I use final cut pro. Okay. And um, I've been using it since it came out, since the new version came out in 2010, I think um, is when the final cut 10 came out. Um, so I've been using it since it came out and I've grown up with it, which has been great because like prior to that premiere pro was like a nightmare for me. And using Final Cut was way more intuitive in terms of how to edit and how to tell a story with editing. I love talking, as you've maybe have seen here already. <laughs> and um, I like telling stories to people. And so editing was very second nature to me. As soon as I got a camera and I was like, oh, right, this is about like telling stories. Mm -hmm. It was like, okay, this is second nature to me. So for me, it was like, figure out how to use the camera to the point where it is not a thing. Like I can just, I can just pick up a camera and just use it and not even think about it. Like there's no, every camera I have is like second nature to me, like every control on it, every custom switch, every, everything. Mm. And so that is never, so I use, I, I get all of that out of that is how I get all of that stuff. No out barrier of to entry there. Right. Yeah. Like you said, it's a mom. Right. right. It's just part of you. And so I don't use iPhones and stuff like, so for me, like a lot of people may start in this world of video production with an iPhone because it's the easiest thing. Like it's, it's something in your pocket and you can go right with it. And I luckily had the privilege of having like a job where they were like, here's an actual camera, figure out how to use that. And so I always had this camera to try to have to figure out. And the thing is, is like, the second I try to use an iPhone to film something, it is a mess. And and I don't mean a, and it's a mess of like, I don't mean it as a mess of like, I know how to get good quality out of an iPhone. I could probably get 
80% of this production quality out of an iPhone. I could probably get like 95% out of this production quality out of an iPhone with this. The problem is, is that the iPhone's not designed to do this. So all of the issues that you have to overcome on the iPhone are become the barriers. Like, keeping the thing charged or having enough space on it or, you know, figuring out the ways to transfer things from the iPhone because it doesn't have a memory card and it doesn't mm -hmm. have a battery. And, you know, if, if the phone is where it is, you know, like if you're in a constrained area and the phone is where it is and you need to change a focal length, how do you do that? You know, like granted now the new phones do have three lenses, but like, you know, I have like, 17 lenses you know what i mean like i have pretty much every focal length you can imagine like if i need to get wide i can get wide if i need to get close i can get close like whatever it needs to be so um so that part of it's always been like that's why i chose it what i find to be really interesting and what i is what i really wanted to bring up here what, with production value talking about this part of it is in the vinyl community you have a lot of people that really, 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 really value audio quality, right? Like they value their stereo system like so much. They put millions of dollars into it. And some of them might even have 20, 30, 40,000 subscribers, maybe, maybe not that many, maybe 10,000. I would say if you have over 500 subscribers, you should buy a microphone. And then it's interesting to me that most people don't use a microphone. Like the microphone is like the most important thing. Like, it's more important than, like audio is the most important thing of video, period. Like that is not, no question about it. And luckily, because I was a drummer first, I knew that going into making video. Mm -hmm. So right away, I always knew I had to get good audio. Mm -hmm. um, but like, if you have good, if you have a good microphone, you can have the, the most horrible video and people can sit through the video. You know what I mean? Like, but if it's like the other way around, journey, like yeah, if you're, yeah. <laughs> if your video looks great, like if I had this quality video, but my audio sounded terrible, then you wouldn't want to watch me. You know what I mean? Like, so it you need to have better audio than your video. And that's more important than anything. And like, but it's just funny to me that like a lot of people don't even use like they're talking about all this audio quality on these records. And it's like, you know, the audio quality, this and the audio quality that. And I'm like, I'm having trouble hearing you. Like, you know what I mean? Like, or like, you know, like maybe, maybe you're, yeah. you're, your background air conditioners on or something like that. You know what I mean? And like, and that's the thing. And like, I've wanted to like make videos about like helping people with that, like maybe try this microphone or try that microphone or whatever. Um, but I don't want to come across as preachy and I don't want to come across as like, I, first of all, you do not need any of that. You know what I mean? Like people have these very successful channels right now that don't use any, they just use a computer and like, they're great and they're awesome. And their channels are great again, because of that triangle, they have the content part of it down so well that it doesn't matter that they're not using a microphone or anything else, you know? Sure. Um, but I, I would argue that any of these channels that have like 500 or more subscribers, a thousand subscribers, it's like, Hey man, invest in your channel a little bit, put, put a microphone in there and that would just make it even better. You know what I mean? Like, like, why not? Like, you know what I mean? Like, and also you love audio quality. So when you watch these, here's the thing. One of the other reasons why I do 90% of what I do with any of this production quality is because I have to edit this stuff back. And if I got to sit there and look at it again and I got to edit it, I want it to look good. Like, I don't want to sit there and look through crap and edit. Like, I don't want to have to match 20 shots that don't have the same lighting or don't have the same color correction or don't have the same, you know, like, I don't want to have to sit there and adjust all that because I have, I have. I've had to like polish turds, you know what I mean? Like, and you know, it's like, it's, and that, that, that's not to say that like anybody's making turds out there that like, I mean, I've had, I'm going to say, there are, I'm gonna say Rocco, I'm a bad guy. Yes. There are some that are better than others, but it's funny you said that because um, you're, you're almost, you're almost telling my exact story because I still film on my iPhone and I still edit and all that stuff. But with the podcast, it became very apparent that audio is very important, exactly what you're talking about. And so I finally bit the bullet and got a microphone. That's what I'm talking through now. So so I think you're, you're spot on. I think it, there, there does come a point where you have to kind of look at yourself and be like, okay, what do you want to do with this and, and how far are you willing to go? And a microphone, for the most part, is one of those pieces that's not – terribly expensive you can get a pretty good mic for a couple hundred bucks and then and it's a piece to build off of right because like you're, you're exactly right once your foundation with the audio is set then if you because you know, without that you could have exactly what you said 
it could be the best production. You could have a bunch of fireworks. You could have all kinds of like razzle dazzle. But if you can't be heard, then it's funny you said that because it is kind of a paradox is that these people, these people, there are several folks in the community who are self admitted audiophiles, but yet the audio quality of their own videos <laughs> sometimes leaves less to be desired. So I'd never really considered that before. Which isn't, I mean, you know, again, neither of those things really correlate. But I mean, at the end of the day, so like, you know, I've also, I, I do, I work in marketing. And so I, I'm fascinated by marketing. And, and when I get it, when I got into all these YouTube channels talking about video production and cameras and stuff like that, they're all about marketing. They're all about building brands and, you know, merchandise and, and all that stuff. And for them, it's like, okay, we're going to be talking about cameras, so we need to film in 4K, and we need to film with good lighting, and we need to film everything perfectly because we're talking about cameras, you know what I mean? So to me, I'm like, well, you're talking about audio quality. Why not have really good audio quality? Why not have, like, you know, it backs up your brand. It backs up what your channel is trying to present, you know what I mean? Like, um, and, I mean, it, you know, it... For for the editing side of things, like you were mentioning, putting in like um, those little like funny snippets or whatever, you do that too in your videos, by the way, which is right. awesome. Like, right. <laughs> it's just hilarious. It's fun to do. Um, I don't plan those things out, or at least most of the time I don't. If there's a silly reference, if I say something stupid in a video and I'm like, oh yeah, okay, like and and it's just a direct. Like I think I think one time I said something about like um, large Marge or whatever, and it was just like you know it was like. <laughs> Well, yeah, large right marge is top, right? yep. large marge is going in the video then you know what I mean like so um so that so that's where like those things come in but planning out the video from a um the, the biggest thing that I plan is the content like like I spend too and I I probably spend too much time with it and I probably don't produce enough videos because I spend too much time formulating a script about something or trying to find something that's not just like, Hey, look, I got a new record. Like I, I love, and then, and then that's the funny thing. I constantly watch videos of people that are like, Hey, I got a new record and they just show it. You know what I mean? Like, and then I kill myself because I'm like, no, you shouldn't make a video about just show that record. Like you should do, make it more meaningful, put, put more, you know, value into it. Talk about the history of it. Talk about whatever, but that takes more time. And then like that, that's, so that's where I put most. So at this point, like, I have everything up, like everything that you see behind me, or if like I use the other area that I film in upstairs, like all this stuff is like, I can, if I want to, if I wanted to film something, boom, I could just set it up and film, just turn this light on. 98% of everything down here is not even like, it's like bolted in or in a way that like, I don't have to move anything. I just come in and sit down and go and it's always the same and it's always exactly the settings are the same and everything's the same and I don't have to worry about anything. Mm -hmm. Um, but I spend all the time like, okay, like I got five new Black Sabbath records. I want to make a video about Black Sabbath. I want to talk about Black Sabbath vinyl, the Rhino vinyl editions. But then I saw Poetry on Plastic and he started talking about these other ones. And I was like, wait, do I need to go get those so I can compare them? And then I'm like, wait, but I could just talk about these. He didn't talk about these. And then I'm like, well, and so just, you know, like that, that's what I go back and forth on and spend all my time on. So I appreciate that. Let's talk about, well, kind of the crux of it, the, the, the music and, and your collecting journey. And you said a little bit of this in the pregame, but, um, you know, you said, and I don't want to take the words out of your mouth, but obviously family comes first and, and it, it kind of caused a, a two part, right? You were collecting records way earlier than the family thing happened. Now you're back into it. Tell us about your, your collecting journey. So the collecting journey started in 2000 when I graduated high school and I moved into like a college house and I didn't have any, I didn't have any, I didn't have a music catalog at all. And I was a drummer. So like my whole dream was ever to be a famous drummer. Like that was always, the, that was always the gig, right. To try to be a drummer in a rock band or something like that. Um, or to just do something involved in music. And I actually do that. Like I work at a music company. And so like I do things involved in music still, and mm -hmm. I still do play. I've got a drum set sitting right there. So like, um, but like, I didn't, when I, when I got out of high school, I didn't have any music collection. I had like nothing. I had like five CDs and like, I think I've talked about a couple of them that I had, 
Um, and I think I talked to you about it on one of it. I had Soul Asylum and Dr. Dre. Oh, yeah. I had Soul Asylum, <laughs> Grave Dancers Union, and Dr. Dre, The Chronic. Oh, like on. those were like it was like two like completely different spectrums. <laughs> um, and I was a huge Nirvana fan, so like it was odd. I had a ton of stuff on cassette. I was always. For me, man, it's always about like just beg and borrow and steal. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, like I was like, I'll collect cassettes when everyone was collecting CDs. And then when they everyone's zig, getting in, zag. I can appreciate when it. everyone's getting digital, I'll go get vinyl. You know what I mean? Cause like that way, like, you know, I could just have stuff. But um, I wanted to amass a collection and I started to just, I was like, I said to myself, I was like, if you're gonna be a musician, you gotta have a bigger music collection. So I was like, I went out and bought a turntable and I went out and bought records. And I bought, I found like this crappy Fisher turntable that I still have, that I still used up until two years ago, um, was my only turntable that I ever bought. And it was like a Fisher MT, uh, I never remember the serial number for it, but it's like from 1975 like or whatever. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it was missing a foot when I bought it and I wedged a piece of styrofoam underneath of it and literally used it like that up until like two Lovely. years ago. And, um, and so it was always about just get more records, you know, like, and a lot of the times it wasn't even like about condition or like, you know, it was just, people would just hand me records and I would take them. Um, so that's how like a lot of the like collection, like at least got, started mm -hmm. was just people just handing me boxes of records and sure. me going through their dirt and finding their dirt and figuring out how to deal with it from there. I've always been fascinated with it. My, my dad had records and my brothers had records um, when they were younger, but like they, they all got lost over the years. So like, I remember they had Pink Floyd records. I remember my brother's a huge Pink Floyd fan. And I remember he had a bunch of Pink Floyd records and I cry to this day. Cause I know he had dark side and the wall and animals. And I don't know where they went. Uh -huh. I have all of them now, but like, I don't know where his originals went. I wish I wish I still had them. Um, but so that's where I started getting lots of records and then literally finding Daptone Records. It's one of the reasons I started the channel was because of my love of Daptone Records. And like, I, I sound like a fanboy when I talk about them, but they really do have a big part of my vinyl journey, as well as just opening up my musical mind to so many more things besides mm -hmm. just like funk or jam band music. You know, like I have so many friends and I, and God love them, man. Like I love my friends, but like so many fish fre fish head friends and grateful dead head friends. And they have like, you know, trunk fulls of every cassette of every record of every show that the dead has ever done. You know what I mean? Yeah. But like, I, I wasn't really into that kind of stuff. And so like, I do like that scene, but like a lot of people, you know, like a lot of people get into like the jam band scene, but I got into like Badesky Martin and Wood or Soul Live and stuff like that. And they kind of like are on the fringe of that scene, but not really in the jam bands. Like most people would consider them into the jam band scene, but they're not really like, I mean, Badesky Martin and Wood and Soul Live are more jazz. I mean, they were on Blue Note Records. And so when Daptone, when I found Daptone, which was right around like 2002, it changed everything for me. Like it changed, like I was like, I was like, yes, like this is what I love about records. Like I bought a Sharon Jones record and it looked, you know, it was, it was the first Sharon Jones record, um, Dap Dippin' with, uh, the, with Sharon Jones and the Dap Kings. And, um, just finding that was like, it, at the moment I thought it was from the sixties, right? Cause that's what they try to do. Like they try to make their records look like they're from the sixties and, and sound like, like yep. and everything. Yeah. But you know, like this was recorded in 2002, you know what I mean? And it was like, Oh crap. You know what I mean? Like, and so like it, it changed everything for me and like everything about it, the aesthetic of like, they were getting, they were selling 45s, you know, the looks of the records. Like I would see pictures of like their studio and stuff. And it was like, I was like, man, I want to have like a turntable like that. Like I want to have like, I want my stuff to look like that. Like I want to have a big, you know, like thing with like, you know, a, a reel to reel and stuff like that. You know, like That's this true. stuff's awesome. You know what I mean? Like this is just cool. Like, I mean, everything about this is cool. So like they really influenced it. And then like through the music, man, like, I mean, their Afro beat stuff, like, you know, Sharon Jones is on that, like James Brown, female vocal side but then like the the second you trans 
for from her, you have like the Budos band, and then you have like Boogaloo stuff with Sugarman Three. They get into like Latin stuff. They get into you know things that I've never even heard of. Like I, I've never, I never would have considered getting into like Soldies, um, you know, like Richie Valens type stuff. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like mm-hmm. stuff that they that they're reproducing now from Penrose Records and the West Coast stuff that they're doing. I never would have considered listening to that stuff and they're reproducing it now in 2023 and it sounds amazing and they do everything to tape. And that's the, that's the other funny thing. So I got really into that stuff and now flash forward to like MoFi gate, you know what I mean? And all this stuff and everybody talking about like analog records and all this stuff. And I'm like, have you guys ever heard of Daptone Records? Like these guys literally Pretty still cool. cut to like they literally record their stuff to tape and then cut the tape and like they don't even have computers in the studio, you know? Like mm-hmm. and so it's all analog, like all analog chain like right down to the pressing, like and sometimes they only press 1500 records, you know? Like um so it, it was it was that so that is where then it really started to take off and then from there it was like everything I could find, you know, like anything and everything, like it mostly revolves around funk and soul and jazz. But like, I mean, I love rock stuff. I love, I love the nostalgia of vinyl. So like having an awesome thin Lizzie record is sick. You know what I mean? Like that's just cool. Like, right. You know what I mean? Like that's just great. So like, but I also really love having like a Dina Washington record. That's like, you know, vocal jazz or something, you know, like, which I love letting vinyl like completely get me into new things. Like I've never been into folk music and I've just started recently in the past year, really getting into folk stuff. Like um, I got that story of Vanguard records from um, vinyl me please. Mm -hmm. And I also got um, the Bruce Springsteen stuff. So um, I mean, I love folk music now and I was never into it before. So like, I just like, I like records dictating what I listen to at this point. Well, you bring up an interesting point, and we were going to talk about this. So let's go ahead and jump into it. But like a curation service like Vinyl Me, please, because I think where they started and where a lot of these services start is they they try to serve up music, which they, they like. They've got like a, a group of curators, X amount of people that work for the company that want to serve it up. And I know that's one thing I've enjoyed about your channel is that, you know, because of the taste and talking about Daptone, like I was a bit, like, I still am a big Charles Bradley guy. I saw Charles several times, like. Phenomenal. So I really appreciate what you're talking about from the Daptone piece. But finally, please, and a lot of these curation services take it next level because they take you on a journey, right or wrong. And sometimes I don't buy it and sometimes I do. But through your channel, I kind of I, I live vicariously. And sometimes, like I've told you, you've cost me some money, Rocco. I've, I've went and that that Ghetto Records box set, Sight Unseen, you were so passionate about it and got a good price in my mind, a good price um, that I just bid on it. And it was good stuff, right? But tell me has the vinyl me please we'll just we'll just we'll say them for the curation service has that made the difference for you in terms of sourcing new music to find what's wait, wait so you're asking like is that one of the main ways i find new music yeah because like you that? know because because you know let's go back 20 30 years ago like new bands new music was usually found through terrestrial radio right then you come up and, and i think we're about the same age Napster, file sharing, you know, there's all these different ways right. people are learning about new music, but now we're kind of in an interesting area because we have information at our fingertips, but we're not, we're, we're, we're not really conditioned or, or at least it's not served up for us as easily as it used to be. At least I feel that way. So there's been a gap for me and I'm speaking for me right here from for the last 10 years, I would say I have not, it's not been as easy for me to find new music unless I really leaned into some people I knew or what have you. So I think that's the strength of the curation service like vinyl me please, because while they do elevate some things for your consideration or titles or artists that maybe don't grab me, maybe don't grab you. The ethos is still there is that they are passionate enough to say, Hey, you don't know about ghetto records. We've got a box set. We thought we were, we were motivated to the point to get all these rare titles, put them on vinyl, put them together, serve it up. So there's a long winded way to ask, has that been a, a benefit or a detriment? Well, I guess you could say it's a detriment to your wallet, but a benefit for Definitely. you learning about new music is curation services as a whole. Yeah, I, absolutely. So they definitely help. And I, I know what you're saying. I 
I have a very weird way that I find new music. And, uh, but I mean, maybe it's not that weird, but like, it's, it's, I find it like, I just let myself go down. Like I call it just going down the rabbit hole. You know what I mean? So, um, you know, it's like you find jazz is a great example of this. Like, (laughs) Well, I'm sorry. What did you just say about uh, you well, said well, something? Not, well, like a deep dive, like because like yeah. it, it's like YouTube or any kind of information gathering is like you start one place and then you hear something else, so you start pulling at the thread of that. So I can appreciate what you're saying. There. And and vinyl me please or these curation services are amazing with that because or well, I I shouldn't even speak to a lot of these other services. Vinyl me please is the only one that I've ever used in terms of like a, a record of the month club or anything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. And the only reason why I do use it is because, like you're saying, I mean, like, it has turned me on to stuff that I never would have chosen to put in my in my collection. I didn't mean to plug this earlier. I just happened to say it. But that Thin Lizzy record's a perfect example. Like, yeah. like that's something that I never would have ever bought on my own. My friend Frank is also signed up for Vinyl Me Please. And he got it. He, I actually had it swapped out. I wasn't even going to get it. And he was like, oh, dude, I'm so excited for this uh, this Thin Lizzy. And I was like, really? I'm like, I mean, I know about them. Like, boys are back in town and all. Like, But, like, you know, I'm not really that into it. And then, like, the curation, like, everything that they provide with the service is great. So, like, that that entire packaging of that particular pressing and everything, when I put it on, it was phenomenal. And it was just like, holy crap. But then... What happens is for me, I go, okay, now I'm into Thin Lizzy. Now I want to get three other Thin Lizzy records. And then I start going on Discogs and I'm like, okay, Thin Lizzy, what's their first album? And then what's their second album? And, and, and I'm a completist too. Like, I'm like, I'm like, okay, well, if I like Thin Lizzy now, I need to have all their records now. Like I, that's just it. I'll, so they're on a list now and I need, I will eventually get all of the Thin Lizzy records. Like, Black Sabbath, I mean, I, I mentioned that a few minutes ago, but, like, Black Sabbath is just, that just happened with them. Like, for years, I've wanted them, and then it finally got to the point where I was like, all right, I'm 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 going to finally bite the bullet on this and go get the Black Sabbath records, and I'm like, all right, let's start with number one, Black Sabbath, and then, you know, like, Master of Reality, and, like, you know, like just go right through all of them and find all of them, and I didn't get, I don't go into the D.O. years, but, like, um, and I don't have... I'm going to eventually get technical ecstasy and um, uh, never say die. But um, the other ones, I mean, I never heard sabotage before. And so like, you know, which I know that's like people. And that's another reason why I'm like hesitant to make the video about, about black Sabbath. People were like, never heard sabotage, man. Bro. Like, you know, like, yeah, 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 but yeah. it's such a great, it's such a great album. And the thing is, is I've heard the popular tracks on it, but I've never heard all of the other tracks, which is another thing that I, really 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 love about vinyl and why i actually there is a purist side of me i'm not like die hard about like this needs to be analog or all analog but what i am die hard about is i i would like it to be as close to the original reproduction like one thing that i hated about cds was um i always use this as an example miles davis volume one for blue note records the the cd version of that that they put out like i don't know back in like 2000 or whatever it's not even it's not even the same record it's like a complete amalgamation of like alternate takes or whatever it was from that 1500 record blue note 1501 miles davis you know volume one whatever it is that that like 1500 series record isn't even the same record it's like because CDs could pack in 80 minutes. So they threw in all these extra tracks or they'll take out other tracks. And it's like, this isn't what the thing was. Like I remember, um, and like Beatles records, you know, like, like even the UK pressings versus the American pressings, like that was something I wasn't even aware of until like a couple years ago with my, even my own Beatles stuff. And so it's like, that's stuff that I do really like to be purist about. Like I like the original track listing. I want the artist to have it the way that the artist intended it. I mean, if it's not digital, I mean, if it's digital, if it's a digital pressing to make millions of copies of a record, it's like, all right, whatever. But like, as long as it's the same thing, you know, I'm with you. So, so. before, so before we round in third here, before we move to the lightning round, I want to ask you one more thing. And, and this is kind of breaking news in the sense that you just mentioned this in a recent video. Talking about vinyl me, please. 
clearly your enthusiasm for the brand and the company as a parent. Like I said, you've cost me some money in terms of the things I've bought for, you know, that you've recommended, right? You get a record and some other titles. So I even made the joke, I think on one of your videos in the comments, I'm like, these guys need to start cutting you a piece of this pie because <laughs> you're making them some money. Anyway. So, so tell me about this new development with, I guess they reached out to you and, and about collaborating in some way, shape or form. Like, what can you say about that? So basically they saw one of the videos that I made uh, about like, I think it was like the kind of like 101, like all about the service introduction to Vinyl Me Please, um, which again, I've never been sponsored by them or anything. They've never, I've never reached out to them or anything. In fact, I've had trouble getting a hold of them for customer service a lot of times. <laughs> um, but um, but they, I, I said in one of the videos, you know, if they ever wanted to reach out to me, that'd be great. And so their CEO, Cam, um, I think his name's Cam. I hope it is. Wow. Cam Shaper, um, yeah. Cam yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he reached out to me and was like, hey, man, you know, like I saw your videos. I, I think your production quality is great. And, you know, like we love the stuff that you're saying, good, bad, and the ugly about the service. We'd love to, you know, do some stuff with you. So um, I don't really do social media. And that's a whole other thing. We could talk for four hours about that. Um, <laughs> but I, I know that I should. And I, we talked about earlier about marketing and all that stuff. And eventually I probably will. It's, there's a whole, it's just a whole thing with me with social media. So they reached out and they were like, hey, do you want to make like social media content for us? And I was like, well, they were specifically like, you know, if you wanted to like talk about some stuff, you know, make these short little videos and you could post it on your social media and then share it with ours and stuff. And I was like, well... I don't really have social media. I don't really have like any like channels like that. Like I don't, I really don't ask what it. mountain like, in Montana you lived on. <laughs> seriously. Right. So, um, that is actually like, I, again, I don't, I don't have Instagram, you know, like I don't. And when I say people, people say like, they don't have Instagram. Like I literally, like, I don't even have the app on my phone. I don't scroll through it. I never use it. Like I don't have an account. I've never used it. Like, um, but I do work for marketing <laughs> that, I mean, I understand, I understand how to program for it and I understand what people do with it. You know what I mean? So like, um, it's a so conscious they, choice not to have social media as prevalent as society seems to make it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and also as like being somebody who makes videos and photos, you would think that I'd be, you know, embracing it. Right. But whatever. So I, I've probably cost myself so much, work by not having it right so <laughs> in this case i was like hey i probably should you know reach out back to you guys and do something so they were really cool about it so like there hasn't been like anything like major in terms of like like i made these short little videos that are just like quick little promo pieces one was like talking about it was basically the same stuff we've already talked about like one of them was like, you know, um, the basics of the service, you know, talking about the tracks and like how to sign up for it. And then another one was they wanted a big promo about the eight free records. So, yeah. you know, like, which I, again, like I, I wouldn't do any of these things if I didn't believe in any of this stuff. Of course. And I think that is probably the greatest promotion like ever, like they're giving away eight free records. Like if you sign up for the service at any time this year, you can get eight free records and and the choice of records, like I personally chose $320 worth of records, but some of my records were basic little like $30 records, like some of the cheaper ones on their service. If I only kept it to their most expensive ones, I mean, I could have gotten $500 worth of records for oh, yeah. free. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, like, I think that's pretty awesome. And I mean, like, that's also a great way to completely expand your collection. I got a public enemy record. I got, um, that Dina Washington record, vocal jazz, like I've, I've never listened to that before. So I was like, I'll throw a flyer out on that one. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's been awesome. So like, I hope that I could do more stuff with them in the future. Like that's the hope. Sure. And then um, they are sending me a box set to review. So that's going to be awesome. Um, and I would always be upfront about any of that stuff too. Even if like they sent me something and I got it and I was like, I don't really think you should get this. I would probably say that, like, I would, you know, probably shoot myself in the foot for it. But like, I would say that, you know, like, I would be honest about it and be like, you know, if you're not really into this kind of thing, maybe you shouldn't like, if you're not into Latin soul music, you probably shouldn't get the ghetto records. You know what I mean? Like, no, but if you do like that yeah. stuff, you know, but if you do like, I mean, but that's the thing, like, if I do recommend something, I mean, you mentioned spending money on it. It's like, I've never regretted spending money on any of the vinyl that I have. I mean, like I, it's a treasure to me. Like, like 
it's a treasure to me to own this music. You know what I mean? Like somebody took the time to make it. I'm going to take the time to listen to it and own it. You know what I mean? Like, why not? You know? Sounds awesome. All right. We've made it. Lightning round. We're almost finished. Right. Round third. Use a baseball analogy. Cool. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Top of mind. And we'll just have some fun with it. So when you're record shopping in the wild, your local record store, you're maybe you're traveling, your record store, wherever it is, do you still have from digging? Do you still every once in a while have that record or find a record where you have like an oh shit moment? Like that takes your breath away. It makes it sound like romantic, I guess. But but you know what I mean? Like you're like, wow, I can't believe I just stumbled on this. Oh, all the time. Always. <laughs> Always. Like I like I'm such a fan of this stuff, man. Like I and and I don't have everything. So I mean, like if I if I were out in the wild and I even just saw a Led Zeppelin two, I'm gonna look through every copy. I'm gonna see if it's the Robert Ludwig. Really? I don't have that. You know what I mean? I mean, also I'm gonna consider it. You know, like where 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 so the Led Zeppelin wouldn't impress me as much right now. But like where that would really get me is like something reggae. Reggae always like. I was just in a store in Philadelphia recently and I found this like um this this uh Byron Lee and the Dragonaires and I've never heard it before it was ska from 1964 and I was like oh look at this you know what I mean like I was like and just the cover of it just like totally caught me and like so yeah all the time I love that that's amazing um how do you feel about uh records when like an artist autographs them is it are you indifferent? Do you prefer, I mean, if, if you had a perfect world, if you could have the artist autograph it or not, would you prefer the autograph copy? If I had a perfect world, the artist would autograph it on the shrink wrap, I guess, which <laughs> I do have some of those. Okay. Right. But like, I, so, so I went to, um, again, Daptone records. They did this uh, show back in the day with Naomi Shelton. She passed away uh, not so long ago, but if you get the chance, check out Naomi Shelton and the gospel Queens. Also goes by Naomi Davis and the Gospel Queens. That was her maiden name. Um, but Naomi Shelton was performing. She uh, finished up and we were waiting for Sharon Jones to go on. And she came out and I saw her and I'm holding her record. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to get her to sign this, of course. Like, you know what I mean? And so I got her to sign it and she did. And she signed it right on the actual thing because I had already taken the shrink off of it. Sure, sure. Um but I don't care, you know, like I, you know, it's, that's my copy. I, I She didn't um, personalize it, so it's not like too Rocco or anything. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, her no. name. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm cool with that, you know. Yeah, I noticed, you know, there's some talk in the boards or in some videos that, you know, purists don't want them to do it to jackets. Now I know it's a lot of artists. I can understand. Oh, yeah, and I can appreciate that. But I've noticed even like like the new Matchbox 20 album just came out, right? And they're like, get an autographed copy. And a lot of artists are doing this where they're just signing like these little insert cards. I think that's kind of like, I like that band, but I think it's kind of a cop out that, you know, autograph mm. copy and all it is, is like a three by five card where they signed it. I think that's kind of lame. I actually bought one of those. <laughs> I bought, <laughs> um, I bought this record, uh, El, El Bueno. I always get the name of it wrong. Um, it was a vinyl me please exclusive pressing, but I didn't buy the vinyl me please version. I bought their black and gold version um, it's a it's a guy that was produced by Auerbach from the Black Keys. Oh, Dan Auerbach, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dan Auerbach produced it, but it's these two guys on guitar. It's just like Spanish guitar stuff. You would really like it, probably. It's like almost like a Spanish-y soundtrack stuff. If you look up El Bueno guitar, I'm sure you'll find it. I know the name is El Bueno. I don't know what the rest of the name is. Um, but it was supposed to have a signed insert, and it didn't. I was actually upset about that. And... Um, it had the black and gold copy. And it's funny because Discogs has like the different versions of it. And so now I only have the black and gold, not the black and gold signed edition. And so like, I was like, I was pretty bummed about that, but <laughs> I, I could see how that, I could see how you could see it's like a cop out. I mean, if they're going to do that, they should sign the record, I guess. But then, yeah, I mean, I guess I could see how people would be upset about the jacket too. I mean, yeah, I don't know. So, but, all right. Last see, here's one, the thing. Right. I'd probably, I would probably end up going and buying another copy without the jacket, <laughs> like just so I could have both of them anyway. Like it's, anyway, go ahead. The sickness is real. No, I'm with it's you. supposed to be a lightning round. I'll show that. No, up. no, no. You're good. All right. Last one I got for you. So what's one piece of advice or a practice you feel every collector should add to their tool belt? Either you learned it through yourself uh trial and error you learned it from somebody else what would be that one thing one thing oh god there's so many things um i i would i mean i guess i would just have to put it out there i mean i guess at this point cleaning is probably the the number one psa because it's the number one thing that can really damage the records like records are so resilient so like you know like to tell people i mean like 
it would e- it would either be one of two things. It would e- if it's going to have to be like something practical, it would be don't clean your records unless you know what you're doing because otherwise you're going to do more harm to them than good. Mm-hmm. So that literally goes for like do not spray your records and wipe them down with those cloth things like do not do that. You know what I mean? Like if you don't know what you're doing about cleaning a record, don't clean them. Like they'll be in better condition not being it cleaned is, right. than they would be messing them up with a bad cleaning. On the flip side, I would also say focus on just getting more records and getting more music. You know what I mean? Like getting more music is 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 probably the most important thing I would say any collector should focus on. Is like if you're not focusing on the music, I'm not really sure why you're doing it. But I mean, I guess there are people out there that do it. I just saw there was like a video from that um, um, channel 33 RPM or whatever. He had a video about um, 50% of people don't, or was it something more? 50% of people don't even own a turntable. turntable. Well, sorry. Yeah, no, that that came out with the Taylor Swift RSD uh, situation because a lot of the, the girls and the Swifties, so to speak, who lined up for the recording, did not even have a turntable, right? Like they did, they were just there to have a piece of the Taylor experience, right? So what a time and to I, be alive. Yeah, <laughs> but I go back and forth with it, man, because I, I I love the fact that those Taylor Swift people were out there, man. I love I loved the fact, like I went out to Record Store Day this year and it was like one of the only times that I've ever done it. Like I've never participated in Record Store Day, like ever. And um, I loved the fact that I was standing in line waiting for records, like that I wasn't standing in line waiting for an iPod, that I wasn't standing in line waiting for like, you know, some video game or like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it was, it was so like refreshing to be like, you know, like asking the guy in front of me, like, what are you here for, man? And he's like, Oh, I'm here for all this punk rock stuff. I'm like, Oh, cool. Like, you know, like it was just, that was so cool. Like, so like I, I, you know, like, and there were a lot of people there that were for Taylor Swift, and that was cool. And it and it was funny because as soon as the record store opened, they like let all of them just go do their thing. Um, but like, more power to them. And like, if it's bringing more excitement to all of this, I think that's cool. But I do understand yeah. that there's there's downsides too. But you know, well, Rocco, you survived. You survived the right. grueling because I, I know I'm a tough I'm a tough interrogator when it comes to these exactly. questions. I know how I am. But, uh, but dude, I this thank was you. awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm, 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 I had a lot of fun here. I really love, I've watched your other videos like these and I think they're great. Awesome, and so I really like that you're doing these and I think you should continue doing them. Um, and I definitely would love to do it again. I'd love to keep talking to you, you know, doing other chats or whatever. You can come on, come on my channel or something and chat about stuff or whatever, man. Like this is fun. So awesome. well, Rocco, I really do appreciate it. Like I said, I've been watching your channel almost for It's one of my favorite channels. I don't miss a video top tier content and again my wallet a little sore with you because you cost me some money over the over this past year but it's been fun so Rocco pieces of vinyl is the YouTube channel thanks for joining me sir all right thank you man and that was another trip around the turntable thanks for listening to vinyl community podcasts <laughs>